Uh, we should start at the beginning here by introducing our panel. First, we've got the head of the Louisville Metro Police Department, of course, Chief Steve Conrad. We also have Sadiqwa Reynolds, who is the current president of the Louisville Urban League, who's joining us. Dave Mutchler is also with us. He's the current president of the River City Fraternal Order of Police. Also, we have Dr. Ricky Jones, who serves as the chair of UofL's Department of Pan-African Studies. He's also the founding director of the UofL Center for Race and Inequality. Pastor Joe Phelps, who leads the congregation at Highland Baptist Church. And we have local attorney Kristen Tibbs, who deals with criminal defense, family issues, and personal injury cases. First, thank all of you uh, for joining us. Uh, I want to point out that uh, a more in-depth bio for each of our panelists can be found on our WLKY app right now. We have to get that in. Uh, but first, you know, we should start at the beginning. You can't really fix any problems until you identify what problems are. So, Chief Conrad, uh, let, let's start with you. In, in, in terms of race in Louisville, what do you see as the problems? Well, I, I, I have to tell you, race, I think, is, is a critical component of, of everything we do. Mm -hmm. Everything we do in life, everything we do in our community. Uh, I know it's involved in, in many of the things that we do in the police department. Uh, you know, I, I think so often, though, there is a, a, an effort to blame race or to focus on race as the, as the problem in our community. And I would argue that it isn't race as much as it is lack of opportunities, lack of, of development. Uh, you know, as I talk about crime in our community, particularly violent crime, I, I tend to talk about the impact of poverty and the impact of, of drug addiction and the impact of, of the failure of families and churches and schools and quite frankly the entire criminal justice system to meet the needs of people in this community. Those same root causes, I believe, are, are what is driving the problems in terms of race. And, and when you look at, at you know, many of the minority neighborhoods that we have in our community, many of those problems are, are present in those neighborhoods. You mentioned the criminal justice system, Krista, that, that brings me over to you. Same question, what do you, what, what do you see uh, when we're talking about race in Louisville? What do you identify as the problems? Well, it's hard to just talk about race in Louisville and to get to all of that in, in one hour, but I agree with Chief Conrad and the communities that you, first of all, if you're talking about minority communities, generally minorities probably make up what 18, 20% of the city, but we are probably 60 to 70% of the people in the criminal justice system. I know in the juvenile system, uh, we probably make up 20% of the school body, but if you go to juvenile court on any day, uh, you'll see black juveniles are probably 70% of the people in the system. So then you have to ask yourself, how do we get there? You know, what is the root causes of getting there? Chief Conrad hit on one thing, yes, economics. I think we all can agree, West End, Louisville, is not economically as developed as other uh, parts of the community, not just the West End. If you look at, you know, uh, Portland, Shively, all those areas, we, we have clearly an economic problem. Uh, and there's a lot of things. What we see, and I can't speak for all the practitioners in the uh, criminal justice system, but one of the things that I think uh, is an issue is that when you look at what is causing a lot of the crime, and I think Chief Conrad, obviously Ms. Mulcher would probably agree, is drug offenses and drug crime. Well, we have, until recently, have never really addressed, you know, right now, if you look at it, we look at addiction uh, as a public health crisis. Uh, and if you just saw J-Town is doing an amnesty program where you can drop off whatever drug paraphernalia you have, don't get charged, no questions asked. Well, that's very nice. When I first, and I've been doing this about 13 years, people who have been doing this 20, 30 years, you know, we never had that response when it was a crack ep epidemic in the 80s and the 90s, you know. When now that is, and a lot of people believe this, and you read these in articles across the country, you know, now that heroin is a big deal uh, and has hit white suburban communities, and somebody, when Rebecca is losing her uh, family to drugs and she's about to lose her kids and it's a big issue, uh, we need to now address it as a public health crisis. Mm -hmm. But when Ronisha was, had a crack problem and she was getting uh, incarcerated and she was losing her kids, it was a crime problem. You know, in the 90s, if you look at from a federal sentencing guideline, we had 100 to 1 crack cocaine ratio for sentencing people. Uh, I remember when I first started as a public defender back in the early 2000s, I had clients who were looking at 10 to 20 years 
10 flat mandatory time and I went to trial on a guy who only possessed, possessed, not trafficked, less than two grams of cocaine. Because at the time, it was treated as a crime problem mm -hmm. and then it was 10 to 20 years and because he had a prior substance abuse problem, he was a subsequent possessor offender, which police officers and, and defense attorneys will tell you and, uh, and it's one of the reasons we passed House Bill, I think, what, 463, that now finally admits here in Kentucky that we have a drug addiction problem. Uh, but that individual was looking at 10 to 20 years, and we had to go to trial. And luckily, I had a jury who, by the way, happens to be, it was one of the few diverse juries I had, which was happened to be half black. They d acquitted him uh, uh, of, of the possession, but he, I mean, but he was looking at that much time. So think about how many times we have sent people to prison uh, over that issue because we look at defendants coming in as criminals right. versus drug addiction. So that's one of the things I see. Sadiqa, you, you look like you wanted to respond. Well, I think when I think about race in our city, I think that we are a, a city of very polite people. Um, and I think that really does prohibit us from having very real conversations. So when I think about race, it's so much more than just about criminal justice. It's education, mm -hmm. it's economic opportunity. Um, when you think about why certain things are happening in certain parts of the community, what are the policies, what are the laws that were put in place that created those opportunities or lack thereof? So um, it seems to me that race has been something that has been very, very difficult for us to talk about. And it is, um, it is how decisions got made. It is the reason certain decisions got made. And we just don't want to talk about that because quite frankly, it, it was in a lot of our lifetimes. I mean, this is not, old news, this is very current news. And so I think that it, to the extent that we are really not yet ready to be honest, we, we, cripple, off, we cripple ourselves. And I think that we are at risk in our city um, of really having some tough stuff happen if we don't have some very real conversations. They can't be limited just to law enforcement. I mean, we have law enforcement here, I think, because of some of the things happening in this country right now, maybe even some of the things that have happened in Louisville recently. But at the end of the day, this conversation about race cannot be limited to simply law enforcement or criminal justice. This is much, much more than that. And we must have conversations about the root cause of what is going on in our country. So whether it's drug use or the disparity in education, the, the educational gap, I mean the achievement gap, how are we dealing with that? And where does race play a role and why does it play a role? If you think about West Louisville, for example, what was the role of redlining? What were the roles of the banks? How did it end up that West Louisville is how it is? And so, and, and of course, there are plenty of people in West Louisville who are doing very well. You can't paint any part of this community with a broad brush. But we really do have to have some honest dialogue, and I just don't see that people are really ready for that courageous conversation. And so as long as we're not, we're gonna be stuck. We're gonna get into that conversation today, and I don't want you to think that I'm glazing over anything that any of you all say. We're jotting it down, and we're gonna dive in more. I do wanna continue the conversation of having everyone identify the problems. And Pastor Phelps, I'm gonna to come to you next. Dr. Jones, you're gonna be on deck because I wanna to talk to you about something specific. <laughs> hey, you're but, running a show, man. <laughs> Pastor Phelps, I wanna to come to you because a lot of people have said over the years that Sunday morning is the most segregated time in America. You've got your black church and you've got your white churches. Uh, you lead a very diverse congregation. So from, from your perspective, what do you identify as the problem facing Louisville when it comes to race? You won't be surprised to hear me as a minister say that I think the issues are fundamentally spiritual uh, in that uh, there's a blindness uh, in white America, but also in black America to, America, to all the realities that uh, all the things that have just been described uh, create within a black uh, uh, community. Uh, it's imperative, it seems to me, that we talk about uh, the unfairness and the disempowerment that's happened to the black community so that we can begin then to address how to create black power, black wealth, black economies. Part of that's going to be uh, uh, a conversation that the black community has. Part of, the, part of it's going to be a conversation that we need to have within the white community about our privilege and about how that has been mm -hmm. systematically abused by us, often unintentionally or unconsciously, I'll say it that way, Un often unconsciously. We now need to hear how our white privilege is affecting uh, people of other races, especially the black community. It's a spiritual issue. We once were blind. Now we need to see. Dr. Jones, I've sat in a number of your classes as a student at UofL, so I know you have a reaction to that when we talk about the root causes of, of race and, and poverty. Mm. Well, you know, Mr. King, you come out of a, a, 
a culture of thinkers at, at U of L where we really do try to dive more deeply into things. And Krishna said an hour isn't long enough, but it's certainly better than a three to five minute, you know, space that you get on a normal news broadcast. And so what Sadiq was started to touch on, I think, was the idea, you'll recognize these terms, ontology and epistemology. Mm -hmm. Ontology being the reality, you know, what exists. But epistemology really diving into why these things exist. And so when you look at most of the markers in America, not just here in Louisville, but in my hometown of Atlanta, wherever you know, any of us are from, we go across this country you know, from the Northwest to the Southeast, and we'll find these markers showing up in, in black America. Disproportionate poverty. I mean, average poverty in America usually ranges somewhere between seven and 10% poverty right now. Over a quarter of black Americans are impoverished. Over a third of black children are impoverished in this country. I mean, those are staggering numbers. Black men, five to six percent of the population of the country, making up almost half the jail and prison population of the country. Disproportionate suspensions, undereducated, uneducated altogether, unemployed or, or, or underemployed. I mean, high rates of recidivism, disproportionate punishment for similar mm -hmm. crimes, arrested more frequently, imprisoned longer. So for, for me, when you really parachute in and you look at this, you ask this ontological and epistemological question. And, and I think we got two choices. Either black people are the most derelict, malfeasant people that God has ever placed on right. the face of the earth, and I include God for you, Reverend. Yeah. Yeah. Thank or you. there is something going on or has gone on wrong systemically in the country, right? And so you're talking about a race of people that did not arrive on the world stage in 1619 as slaves, certainly, and that's what education does for you when you understand what has gone on with black people before that, but in this country, they arrived on the stage is that. And so when you look at the long history of this country's original sin, well actually this country's second sin because the original sin was the mistreatment of Native Americans, right. you know, but as we move forward in how black people have been handled in this country across the board for that, for that long, you can understand why we see some of the realities that we see across the country. So then as educators, as, as leaders of social justice organizations, as FOP presidents, as chiefs of police, as attorneys, as ministers, all of these things, we have to ask, what are we going to do now in the 21st century to deal with that population of American citizens, right? Not people from somewhere else, not aliens, you know, from another planet, but American citizens. Men, women, children, and babies who have lives, hopes, aspirations of their own, who deserve to be treated as human beings and given the best chance to make it, in dire circumstances, how do we address what's going on? So we can't talk about these things in compartmentalized or bifurcated terms, right? We can't just say, well, it's race or class. No, it's both. Right. Black people are disproportionately poor. Why? Those things are linked. Black people disproportionately go to poorer schools. Those things are linked. What's going on with that? And so that's the bigger issue for us to handle, and it's tough to get our arms around, right? And so when we have these flashpoints, people tend to go to their corners, and they'll mm -hmm. take rather extreme views and they're going to defend what they see as theirs, right? And quite often that lines us up along lines of race. But the reality is we have good people on both sides. Uh -huh. But we, we can't just have good people on both sides who do nothing. I think Sadiq was right, a very polite city here. Um, a lot of folk, um, and this is a country of rugged individualism, so everybody's kind of, as we, you say in the projects, me, my foe, and no more, <laughs> right? And they want to take care of themselves as individuals and they don't care about the collective. Where the reality is if the collective suffers at some point, that's going to spill over onto you as an Absolutely. individual or into people that you care about. And so Dave, that's what you, I, you come from an <coughs> interesting perspective uh, overseeing the FOP. You know, you, you've got your hands in a, in a lot of different um, avenues uh, in the city. F from your perspective, what, what do you identify as, as the problems? Well, I think, it, you know, everybody here on the panel has talked about some of these root causes, which obviously cause uh, a lot of frustration uh, in minority communities. And if you look at it doesn't matter what city, county, state you're in, uh, the one thing that remains constant is, is that, at least for the most part, there is law enforcement. We're, we're omnipresent. Um, and so it's easy uh, to lash out at law enforcement when you're frustrated about things uh, that may have been you know, in place for years and years and years. Um, and, and one of the other uh, things regarding that um, is that, you know, the way that a lot of officers feel, and not just in Louisville, I'm sure, is that uh, uh, you know this is a this is a big problem, and a lot of it is laid at the feet of police officers. That's right. And oftentimes, though, by the time street level police officers are involved, um, 
we have to deal with the situation at hand, mm -hmm. yes. and it's, mm -hmm. it's almost too late That's right. for, for any other type of intervention, but okay, we have to deal with what do we have here? Do we have a crime? Do we have something we can help somebody you know, uh, out with? What do we do? And it's, it, by the time it gets to us, uh, you know, it's, it's too late for us to start talking about root causes when we're at the corner of Ninth and Liberty talking to somebody on the street um, who has been assaulted or just assaulted somebody. Um, but I think that there are a lot of, uh, of folks out there who want to lay these issues at the feet of the police, uh, and unfortunately, it's going to take a whole lot more than law enforcement to solve a lot of these problems. Well, then where's the common ground? That, that, that's the question then. But I disagree with that. Okay. Because I, I, I don't think that people try to lay all of these issues at the face of police. No thinking person would say that police are responsible for poverty. No thinking person is going to say that police are responsible for the crisis of faith in, in religious institutions. That's because of many ministers around this country across the lines of race turning churches into banks, into businesses. I mean, yeah. that, and they have to deal with that. That's their stuff. Yeah. But what people do get upset about is that what they do lay at the feet of police, whether it be in Louisville, Atlanta, or in LA, is when officers make mistakes, mm -hmm. where innocent and sometimes unarmed people are not just injured, but killed. Now, you can simultaneously, and so there's lashing out from the community, but there's also lashing out from law enforcement, which is, these are agents of the state, right? And agents of the state all carry a particular responsibility when you talk about having people's lives in their hands. So we can simultaneously say, look, all of us appreciate police. Most of us do. You're gonna, it's it's going to be the rare person you find to say that this will be a better society without police. But we can simultaneously say that, like, like all of us, when police make mistakes, they need to own up to it. And I think people are very, very frustrated when you see unarmed people shot, unarmed people choked to death on the streets of New York, an unarmed black child killed within two or three seconds of an officer arriving. You see a situation in L.A. recently where a mentally challenged man who was just asleep on the lawn, unarmed, killed by police. You see a situation in Miami where an autistic guy has his caregiver shot, and, and, and thankfully the caregiver didn't die, and he asked the officer, why'd you shoot me? And the response is, I don't know. And so if somebody makes a mistake, if my child makes a mistake, I'm going to say, hey, you were wrong, and I got to correct her. And if I make a mistake towards her or anyone else, I got to admit that I'm wrong. The question that people are really asking around this country, when do officers, when do police departments say, hey, this right here, this was wrong. We cannot condone this. We cannot condone this officer killing this 12-year-old child. We can't condone that. And I think, you know, that's a really simple, humane thing, that we don't close ranks when serious uh, mistakes happen sometimes, and other times, absolute atrocities happen. And so what that does, that taints the, the, the hundreds and thousands of officers around this country who are good, law-abiding, upstanding, hard-working people who go out every day and they have the right to come home. In the next, but in innocent the, people have a right to go home too. And so that's, that's a simple thing. Mm -hmm. No, and I think the lack of acknowledgement of those mistakes is what prevents any sort of healing, any sort of growth, any sort of movement. And I think that is where we run into problems. I mean, at some point, you know, you get the answer, well, there may be a lawsuit or there's some legal reason, there's some investigation, but that ends. And then there is still never an apology. And that is really a challenge. It's a challenge in our community. It's a challenge across the country. And I think law enforcement never should be, nor do you want to be painted with a broad brush. But sometimes, and I've heard you before, Dave, you, your brush is pretty broad, and I don't think that's fair. And I think those are the kind of things we've really got to get through and we've got to work through as a community because we are here, and the words that we use are powerful. We can change people's responses to, you know, what happens in our community. I think we have to be responsible, you, me, you know, all of us, in, in how we say things and how we address things, particularly in your position where you're representing, you know, an entire police department. I understand that the chief speaks for the department, but you have been elected by um, those officers, and so I think it matters what you say. And, and I think that's why, really, we wanted you to be here, to really talk from the FOP perspective, because I think that is important for us to really challenge and push back on some of the, your thoughts. Well, and, and I understand that, if I, if I might respond. Of course. Um, I will say that uh, I agree that law enforcement should be used as a bridge whenever it can be, mm -hmm. obviously, because we are here to, to serve the public. Um, but I disagree with the fact that there should never be pushback uh, from law enforcement. We have to remember that, yes, we have you know uh, training, a police academy training, things like that. But in the end, other than the training that we have in order to, to do our job as law enforcement officers, um, 
you know, the chief is in his uniform today. He is, he is no different than any of us, but he's got that uniform on. He's, he's a human being uh, who has a job to do, uh, and he has training to do that job, um, just like all the officers that work for the, the police department mm -hmm. uh, have that job. And, and we, by the way, we don't have conscripts. We have, you know, this is a, a fully volunteer police department, and we have officers who go out into the community uh, and serve that community every day, now for 12 hours a day, a lot of times. Um, and obviously they, they want to go home and, and citizens want to go home as well. But my point is, is that, you know, who else uh, that doesn't have a vested interest in Portland or in Russell or in California will go out there and serve those people and try to make it better for them. I mean, law enforcement does that. And well, when, aren't there several organizations that would do that? Well, I'm, I'm, sure, that, I'm sure that there are other organizations, but obviously, like I was talking about earlier, what people see every day is law enforcement out there responding, you know, to, to calls for service, things like that, uh, from the public. And what, you know, and officers have very good interactions every day with citizens. It doesn't take, you know, we, we do a lot of extra initiatives. We've been doing peace walks, or, but it doesn't, the only time that officers talk to citizens and have positive interactions isn't when we do a peace walk or something like that. I mean, we have officers that I talk to every day that tell me citizens come up to them of all races and, and you know, and ethnicities and tell them, hey, thank you, or hey, I want to tell you that this happened and, and uh, you know, I got my purse back, or whatever the case might be. Most interactions are positive. Okay. And, uh, and I'm not disagreeing with that. I'm not disagreeing with that because I, I want to I clarify yeah. what I was yeah. just saying here. I'm not certainly not disagreeing with that. And, 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 and very quickly, I think that most of the work the officers do is great, mm -hmm. yep. okay? I have a next door neighbor whose son is, is an officer. See him, love him, will protect him with my life. He's a good dude, okay? But here, here's my point. When terrible things happen, none of us can fall back on the good that we do. It'd be very much like Penn State saying, hey, by all accounts, Jerry Sandusky's a great mm -hmm. football coach, yeah. but every now and then, he, he abuses little children. You know, and so we should excuse that because he abuses little children, you know, because he's a great football coach. We, we can't do that. So I think what we really need to do, something has gone wrong across the country and in, this, in, this, in the community, in this community, where certain segments of the community fear officers, all right? And things are going on in this country now where it is clear that we have officers who are fearing certain segments of the community. That's correct. So for and us not to acknowledge that and try to figure out the root of that and figure out what's gone wrong on both sides, yeah. I think we do, we do all of our. Yeah. And the goal here service. is not to shame mm -hmm. the police mm -hmm. right. or to scold them, but to make a better police force, of course, make I, a safer community. I think we'd be doing a disservice if we don't get to Chief Conrad to, to respond. A couple of comments first. You know, our ability to serve this community is 100% contingent on our efforts to build trust with the people that we serve. And we are not going to be able to build that trust if we don't treat people with respect and with dignity and talk to people the way we would want to be talked to in every interaction. Mm -hmm. uh, we spent a lot of time over the last, actually, a year and a half now focusing our training on the concept of procedural justice which really focuses in on, to begin with, that foundation of respect, but then takes it to the next step that interactions with police, people need to come away feeling like they were treated fairly, yeah. like they were heard, like they were given a voice. And it is critical that we are out there doing that. And, and to your point, Dr. Jones, you, you, you have a terrible shooting and you're not going to be able to own up to what occurred. That, it, that destroys all of that work that yeah. we've done, trying to build that trust, trying to build those relationships. And, and I'll agree with, with Sergeant Mutzler, everyone wants to go home at the end of the day, whether you're the police officer or the citizen on the street. And, and the last thing that we ever want to do is have to use force, particularly deadly force. That, that is not something that officers ever want to do. But, but to echo Dave's point, you, we are human. There are times we make mistakes. But I also agree with you that when mistakes are made, we need to take accountability for those mistakes and we need to work to mm -hmm. improve and make sure those mistakes don't happen again. And that's, and, all, and that's they, all you can ask. And, and I would agree. I, I think, you know, you, you go back to, to, you know, back in history to the way police were used. They were used back in the 50s and 60s sometimes to enforce terrible things that were happening on this country that, that directly affected race. And, and we've got to acknowledge that police were used in those fashion. And that's I think good. people can point to examples like that today, but right. I would argue that the vast majority of men and women that do this job and again, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of mimicking or, or, or cop saying exactly what, what Dave just said, but 
They are here because they want to serve. They're here because they want to make a difference. They're trying to serve people, and sometimes that can be a challenge. And, and, and I'll just give you a, a quick example of that. You know, I, I've been doing this now for almost 37 years, and I went to a, a, a church where I, I met with a group of gentlemen in, in West Louisville who had been doing some work in the Parkland neighborhood after that terrible shooting we had down there in 2014. And these gentlemen had, had been in prison and been in problems in their life, and they have, had been born again, they had found Christ, and, and really shared some, some thoughts with me, some very sincere thoughts. And one of the things that they shared with me is they said, Chief, we know you think you're doing good when you come to our doors, but whether you're white, or black, or brown, or male, or female, if you're coming to the door in that uniform, you're the enemy. Right. And you're the enemy until you prove us different. Wow. And you prove us different by how you talk to us and how you treat us. And we're only going to give you about 30 seconds to come across with that, with that information. And I've tried to share that story with our, with our officers because that is critical, again, to their success and to their survival. Is this a battle, battle of rhetoric then? Because, I mean, I, I feel like uh, so much of the conversation is, um, Mr. Mutchler, it sounds like so many people from, from your viewpoint uh, feel like the police are just genuinely bad, and you're defending, no, that's not the case. Not anyone on this panel, of course, but from the community, people seem to just think that the police are bad. We read the Facebook posts. We see what people say. Um, but is, is that really true? Do you really feel like people are just genuinely attacking the police officers? in theory or? Well, no, first of all, I, I want to make sure I'm clear that I think that a vast majority of the public supports okay, police good. officers. Good. Okay. Oh, absolutely. Good. Oh, no, not at all. And I think one of the things that causes the problem or, or the, the, the rhetoric that comes out, mm -hmm. uh, for instance, even some of the, the, the terrible shootings that you referenced, um, is that, and even if it's not one of those type of shootings or, or something like that, there's a use of force or something and there's, and there's video or, or something of it, uh, and people see a 30 second or a one minute video of something uh, and you can you can glean some things from that obviously but you know it takes it takes a full complete investigation of, of facts and of, of testimony from anybody who may have been there seen that been involved in it before you truly have an idea of what happened why it happened whether it was wrong or right what happened and why it happened but you know we're Society in general is you know, impatient. Give it to me now. Yeah. You know, I, I can get on social media. I, give it to me now. Yeah. And this, but is I hard. Think this is hard. Hold on. But it's so hard to sit through. Uh -huh. I'm so sorry. But it's just, Dave, I mean, I think the thing about it is most people, like you said, do not think officers are bad. That is just not right. true. There are lots of people who have very positive interactions with law enforcement. I agree with that 100%. And I guess when you talk about, you know, maybe uh, uh, some folks being frustrated by a video. I mean, think about the benefit of the doubt that is so often given. Think about the last shooting that we had here in our own city. We've had no protest. I mean, there are a few people who are, you know, maybe upset. And, and I mean, everybody wants answers. The chief even said he wanted answers. To, to be questioned does not mean that people don't support. And I think that's sort of a little bit of the frustration that I find. It, we all have, you know, people who we love that are officers. We know somebody who's an officer. Most people can probably think of someone who they've had an interaction with that was positive. So we don't start from a place of hate or dislike. That's not really what it is. This is really about when you do something wrong, can you be questioned? Is it, am I somehow or held accountable? Yes. Or held accountable? And I think that's what the frustration, and that's what I was about to say, was is that when people get mad, I think we're naive to think that Baltimore, Ferguson, Rodney King, the riots there all happen because of one on arm shooting. It is officers get charged with something, they go to, uh, they go to court, and they're not held ac accountable for that. You know, you look, or, or when you have something that you clearly can see that this was. For, like if you look at the Fernando Castile, that situation, if you look at something, unless evidence comes out differently, we can all look at that. And if you talk to officers, and I've, I talk to officers every day in this, and if, and, and if they're not on the record and they'd say, hey, the, I think that that was wrong. But when, when no one comes out and says, hey, this is wrong, and, and when officers are charged and they go to court and they are acquitted, or they're not charged because they're treated differently, then that's where the frustration occurs. I mean, those incidences in Ferguson and Baltimore were not just one isolated incident and then all of a sudden we had a riot. That's, it's been brewing and that's the boiling point. And so I think that what's been brewing for all this time is seeing people go to court and it's like, well, if that happened to me, I'm, my son will be going to prison for a long period of time, but how can they come in our house and, and nothing is, uh, and they're not held accountable? 
you know, and, and like I said, I have a lot of people. I mean, majority of the police officers you, uh, I work with, yeah, hard, very hardworking. They try to be dedicated. They overwork. They have a lot of cases. You know, it, it's just hard. That's just what happens in the criminal justice system. But I think the lack of accountability in the response is what causes the frustration and the outside community looks at it and says, you know, our communities are treated more like a police state. I mean, I have so many clients who tell me they think that when they're in the West End that it's, it feels like they're in Iraq. You know, they get pulled over all the time. They, they're walking down the street. Uh, you know, I had a number of people who were very upset about the Viper unit. I mean, for the last 10 years up until, I know it's now the ninth unit, a mobile unit, but how they felt that they're getting pulled over, frisked, thrown down on the street. And they said, well, this doesn't happen to me when I'm in the East End, but it only happens to me when I'm, it's the over-policing in my community. Mm -hmm. So I think that that is, you know, what is causing a lot of the frustration. Chief, do you acknowledge that as a problem? And, and if so, how, would, how, how do you combat it? What I will acknowledge is that we have some significant crime problems in our community. Uh, we have had 69 homicides already this year. Uh, last year we had 80, and that's the most we'd had in 39 years. Uh, at this rate, we're going to well surpass that. Uh, we have incredible problems with shootings. We've had over 300 shootings this year. Many of these shootings have focused in on about six or seven neighborhoods in, in our community, and most of them are in West Louisville. Uh, we are trying to focus our policing efforts on the neighborhoods that are experiencing a disproportionate amount of crime. Uh, and, and it is, we owe that to the people who live in that community and work in that community to try to do what we can together with them to make it a safer community. Officers will contact people in legal fashion. If there's a traffic violation, they are authorized to make a traffic stop. If they see somebody walking down a sidewalk, they can engage anyone in a conversation and given reasonable suspicion to believe a crime has occurred, they can stop and talk to that person. But it, it is not so much a focus of over-policing as it is trying to get a handle on what's occurring in that community. And, and we, we try a number of different outreach opportunities to make sure that we're engaging people to try to develop information about what's occurring. Every time we have a crime, I'm talking about our, our anonymous tip line. We, we want to solve the problems. We want to reduce the shootings. We want to reduce the homicides. And you're not going to do that if you're not in the neighborhoods where they're occurring. And, and so our focus has been on two things. They, they have been focused on the neighborhoods that are experiencing the biggest in, 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 in terms of numbers of violent crimes, but also we've tried to identify and focus our efforts on arresting and holding accountable the people that we believe are out there pulling those triggers or no, selling I, I those wanna, drugs. Go ahead. Go ahead, Well, Robert. well I wanna, I'd like to switch the subject a little bit, not to get the police up officers off the hook because I think there is a place where they need to be on the hook for at least being able to acknowledge when wrongs are, are, are have occurred by police. But I want to come back to your fancy university word of epistemology and ask why are mm -hmm. there so many uh, crimes in West Lobo? Why are there so many shootings? And I think it get, we come back to the question of uh, empowerment and economics. And he here we are at a place where really the police, can you all are being asked to, to do something, make, uh, keep peace in a place where there really shouldn't be peace because people have been oppressed and held down. And they may be acting it out in the wrong way, but their anger is, is reasonable. They, they've not had the privileges that I've had as a white male. And I rec I'm, I'm just now recognizing that. Uh, and so at, I will say, at least as a, as a churchman, on behalf of uh, myself, I guess, as a, a churchman, I repent of that. I, I do apologize. I recognize that for many years I've lived a I didn't even, I never even heard the term white privilege for years. Uh, now I've heard it. Now I understand it just a little bit. I'm like the blind man in the story in the New Testament who sees a little bit. I see in part. But what I see is we've got to... Uh, not only talk about police and policing and symbolic acts, we've got to talk about those things that will empower the masses, not just the, the few, but the masses of people who live in West Louisville. But that's great for you, but there are a whole lot of white people that don't think white privilege exists. Well, there, that's there, my job. There, there are a whole lot of white people in this city, right, right. in this state, in this, this country. Running for president. Who, who, who believe yeah. that, mm -hmm. the, that the playing field in this country is level and right. everybody gets whatever they work for. Right. 
And so this whole idea of race, white privilege, racism, oppression, marginalization, some even make slavery a positive thing. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, we, yeah, we have yeah, people who make those yeah, arguments. Yeah, yeah. But back to the chief real fast, and chief, you know you my dude. They were <laughs> you, you my guy. I've I, 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 I the around. But, but here, here's the flaw in, in, in the chief's argument. You gonna agree with me on this. Just because you have communities that have higher frequencies of crime and greater percentages of criminals for whatever reason, Okay, certainly lack of opportunity, under education, all of these things quite often create different underground economies, different realities for people. When you talk about people doing drugs, I know, you know, I have a mother who's done drugs ever since I can remember. People who do drugs are just like alcohol. People drink to escape when they overdrink. Yeah. People smoke crack to escape. They smoke weed to escape. That's what they're doing. And it goes back to Krishna's point. Then you're going to take some of these people who are, who are doing drugs or even selling some of these drugs, right? that are not necessarily harming people in the same way that we see many other things harming people. And then we're gonna send them to jail for 10, 15, 20 years, really. But just because you have a disproportionate number of criminals in certain communities, whether it be Louisville, around this country, it does not give law enforcement the right to treat everyone in those communities as potential criminals. So Absolutely. what's the intersection? That's, that's, that's right, when right, things right, break down. Right. Yeah. What's okay. the intersection? If Krishna is saying uh, that there are people who say we feel like we're in a police state, and the chief is saying, well, we're in certain neighbor neighborhoods because they're showing a higher level of crimes. Then it's a circular argument, isn't it? Yeah. Well, it, no, it's, I don't think it is a circle, circular argument. What needs to be done in the middle to fuse those two things? I think you need to have a review of policies that are in place that keep people oppressed. So uh, we really do believe that the answer is jobs and education. And so where, where we spend money building jails, where we spend money doing things to confine people, when do we spend money to empower? When are we going to invest? There when are we but really willing to, to put our money where our mouth is? is. That, no, we, no, we're not talking about no, police. We're, not, we're, we're talking about, about race. We can That's pivot right. from police now. But we can, yeah, because the thing about it is, it, I think somebody said it here earlier, the police are following somebody else's command. That's right. I mean, they are enforcing laws that are in place. Whether those are laws are just or unjust, we need to have that conversation that, right. with someone else. But at the end of the day, what has always been missing is the investment in real education for everybody, that equality in education, the mm -hmm. opportunity for employment. The, the people do not want to talk about how beneficial the good old boy network is. It, you know, even if, if you're talking about catching a cab, interviewing for a job, a name on a resume, how does who I am, what my name is, how I look um, impact my opportunity? And so how does where I live, my zip code, impact my opportunity? Why is it that if I live in the west end of this city, my life expectancy is shorter than someplace else? What do we need to change in order to make a difference there? Why don't we talk about why we can't get real significant investment in West Louisville? Why can't we do that? Why do people say we're not going to spend $7 million in West Louisville on food port or whatever you name your project? Why not? You've spent millions of dollars keeping people in West Louisville from opportunity. You haven't had any commercial investment. When is the time to say we're going to concentrate the money, we're going to concentrate our efforts, and here's what we're going to do? Because the reality is most people in that community are law-abiding citizens who want exactly the same thing that you want to get up in the morning, go to work, take care of their families, and make it home safely every day. And here's the That's what they want. So when are we going to do what is necessary to give folks the opportunity? And I'd like to say this. I use this example because I do think people deny privilege. They don't understand really what privilege is, and white privilege feels like it's so strong, it's a little bit offensive to some. Here is your privilege. Think about a snowstorm. Think about a snowstorm and those snowmobiles come and they clean the road and they scoot all of that snow over to the side and you pack it in and so now those cars can get through. And this happened. I'm driving down the street and I'm like, wow, the roads look great. We've had this huge snowstorm. And then I see a woman in a wheelchair trying to get over the hump that was created by those snow. You, do you understand what I I'm did. saying? Mm -hmm. Because if you can walk, you don't understand why the cuts are in the sidewalk and why you need to be able to push or roll, you know, mm -hmm. roll a wheelchair or push a stroller. And when you have the privilege of walking, you don't think about people who don't. And that's really what the white privilege is about. What is it that you get when you walk into the room that I don't have access to? I may be able to get it if I work harder and do this and do that, but what are those things? And then how can you use that privilege to help other people? Because the reality is, 
we are in a situation now where the hopelessness is beginning to spread. And when we talk about race in Louisville, it's more than just West Louisville. Black people live all over this city, right? I don't live in West Louisville, I work there. But think about even how people get treated in different parts of the city. For example, um, where I live, somebody knocks on my door two o'clock in the morning and I call the police and I go, I'm scared to death. I don't know what's happening. Somebody's banging on the door, the police come. They take the young man home. He was drunk. He was in the wrong neighborhood. He thought it was his house. He messed up. Would that have happened someplace else? Now, this was a long time ago. I'm not talking about the officers we have now. And, and I want to say again, it, it is especially important to me because I know so many of these officers in Louisville. Most of them are wonderful. But it takes one bad one, just like lawyers. I'm mm. a lawyer. All you need is one bad one. And people, you know, there's all kinds of lawyer jokes. So mm. we do have to really force accountability. But I don't want this conversation just to be about police who are really right. following instructions. That's but isn't this really about police, though? No. It, it, no it, I think it is in a serious way. Because, look, black people been getting killed all over this country and all over this city for a very long time. All right? I remember the situation where this 55-year-old this black man was killed years ago in the city by police and he was handcuffed behind his back, all right? And, and the officers were not charged with it, okay? They were, they were let go. They were let go, okay? So some of this isn't just about the, 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 the capitalist argument about investment and all of these things, at least financial investment. This is about investment in humanity. Because mm -hmm. again, let's be real, black people have been killed everywhere. We wouldn't be sitting at this table right now if Dallas hadn't happened if Baton Rouge hadn't happened. We wouldn't be sitting here. We, when, when police were shot, it took this country to a very different place. And please, understand me, hear me well, let me say it slowly. I am not condoning the murder of police officers anywhere in this country, all right? But if we keep going through things, let me say it clearly again, if you're the type of person or you're the type of organization that can never step back and say, hey, you know what? We dead wrong on this one. Well, let's you bring it, get it right. We dead wrong. Well, you let's know what? What Dr. Global. Jones says, you know, and I. That creates say, something. I mean, I think what Chief Conrad is doing now with walking in the neighborhoods is very good. I mean, like I say, my barber, who's there by the, where he was walking in Shawnee, says that he, you know, he cannot eat in the West End because there are no businesses there. He has to go to New Albany. You know, and that's, that makes no sense. But I think Dr. Jones touched on the point, yes, we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for Baton Rouge and Dallas. You know, until police officers were shot, we wouldn't have necessarily this program. We wouldn't, the same thing I said at the beginning, we wouldn't address drug addiction the way we did until it hit white suburban community and now it's a public health crisis. So it's how, it's the face that we put on the problem that's how we respond to it and now address it and now it's a big deal. And I just think we have to be honest, you know. I mean, Dallas and Baton Rouge and like I said, Ferguson didn't happen overnight. <coughs> so the, pro the, uh, the solution is not gonna happen overnight. Bringing it home to Louisville, Chief, obviously you were out in front of a, uh, a police involved shooting in your department uh, within the past several days. Um, when Krishna is talking about how these situations have been bubbling up, is recognizing that part of the reason that you handled this the way that you did? I think it's important and it's really the lessons learned from what we've seen across the country since Ferguson about the importance of police transparency, the importance of, of sharing as much information as you can with the community as quickly as you can. Progress, uh, would you agree? It, we have, we, we have yeah. got an amazing amount of information available to the public on our website. Uh, we have information about officer-involved shootings. We've got information about use of force. We've got uh, links to all of our policies and procedures. We have 14 different data sets that people can look at, traffic stop data, arrest information. We want to share everything we can with people in this community to show that we want to be transparent. One of the things that that has is, is the number of complaints and what people will see on that is I initiate five to one more complaints or investigations against officers for things that I think that they have done wrong that they need to be held accountable for than citizens in our community. When people have the kinds of problems that Kristen had, had mentioned, if they have a problem where they believe they have been treated improperly by an officer, please come forward and file a complaint. And, and we've made that very simple. I mean, you can do it online. It, it requires the completion of an affidavit, which is required by state law, but it can be done online. 
I want our department to do the best job it can. I want us to do all that we can to try to serve this community and to make it better. But I need help from the good people in this community and people that maybe aren't so good in this community. You need help from your officers too though, Chief. And this is something right. that people don't talk about because we don't just have citizens who are afraid of police. Yeah, truth, be cold, we get, truth be told, we got police who are afraid of police. There are police who will tell, policemen and women who will tell you privately, yeah, we got a serious problem in this department. Here in Louisville, that's happened in Louisville. I have had also, conversations with police and, officers. And, 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 I've had conversations with police officers who have said, yeah, this is a problem, but people aren't going to say anything because they're afraid of retribution. What do you mean that's, this? This is a problem. Oh, race, right. abuse, beating people up, what may have you. Okay, it's not just in Louisville, this is around the country, but I'm saying it has happened here. So some of that certainly falls on some of the officers. My point is this, people aren't just making it up when they say that there are some problems with interactions with police. So if you have officers who have trepidation about their own, okay, then there's something going on culturally there within a department. And again, this is not unique to Louisville. Let me be clear, because sometimes it's almost like you know, if you don't totally praise police, then you're totally demonizing them, you know? And that's not what I'm doing. I think you're a great chief. I think you're a great human being. I think you're doing the best you can, but it doesn't mean your department doesn't have problems. And I'm talking about within the department, you know, people closing ranks. And I, don't, I understand some of it. I'm a loyal dude myself, right? But I'm saying some of that can be really unhealthy. Now, it is impossible for me, it is impossible for me to sit here and tell you, oh, no, I'm not lying. You can say, oh, well, I don't believe that's true. And so I will look into the camera. What, what camera? What officers mm -hmm. step up and tell the truth about how you feel about what's going on in your department well, because they're I'm, out there. And I'm going to argue that, that the problems that you're talking about could exist. We have a camera on every single officer out there on the street. We've invested a couple of million dollars in that technology to help us not only document what's occurring, but to provide a, an additional accountability uh, when we do have problems. And a, again, we've got literally gigabytes worth of, of data and, and we're not able to review all of that all of the time. But with you. a complaint, with, with yeah. somebody telling me that there is a problem, we can go back and we can look at those videos and we can take appropriate action to address that problem. Well, I got you, Chief. Next time one of your officers say something to me, next time they say something to you or whatever, I'm going to tell them, don't say another word to me until you're willing to step up and say it publicly, because I'm not lying about that. I mean, and, but and by and the same token, actually, I, I've got to say this too, by the same token, just let, let's, uh, you know, just because somebody comes to you, if a police officer comes to you and says, we've got a problem in the police department, or we've got people closing ranks, whatever the case might be, that, or two people come to tell you that, and there's 1,200 people, that does not mean there's a cultural problem in the Louisville Metro Police Department. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, but to follow up on Doesn't what, exist. what Dr. Jones is saying, yeah. and we probably talked to different police officers, at least two retired police officers who are both black who have talked to me and said, you know, recently the police department has addressed this issue and, and they have been talking about the problem for 10 years or some more and now the police is trying to do more cultural training. Things that they have asked 10 years ago and no one will listen to them, you know, before Chief Conrad uh, uh, was the chief. And, and so I think, you know, to validate what Dr. Jones is saying, I mean, it appears to me to be an issue and I didn't even know he was going to bring that up, but I remember I've had this discussion in recent because of Dallas and these programs, people have mentioned this to me. So, I mean, I don't know how we talk about culture in the police department and, you know, if the police department supports the letter that you wrote last year, you have a culture problem. Just like other corporations have race issues, right? So you may have the best company in the world. They could be a good employer. They might have child care and all other things. But there could still be some issues. I thought you wrote a really inflammatory letter last mm -hmm. year. I thought that you should have apologized. I think you mm -hmm. should have apologized publicly. I think you should have walked away from it. You didn't do that. When you had the opportunity, you doubled down. If really the officers you represent, if that's how they feel, you've got a culture problem. I think Chief is working I, I hard. I disagree with that. I, know, I knew that you would, um, and, and we have Im implicit bias training, we've got a lot of really good stuff going on, but, but the bad is still sometimes there. And so again, a criticism does not mean it is everybody or it is all, oh, but when you have those issues with the leadership, I think sometimes, and so I think there's some accountability 
uh, for all of us. And we've all got to sort of do some self-reflection because we are at a really critical time in our country. And, and words, and I said this before, um, words do hurt, words do inflame. And when you talk about race baiting and hunting people down and, and some of those kinds of things, those things uh, really do lead to really bad outcomes. And so I think we have But they to, are real as well. Um, uh, there's racism, obviously. There, there, there's there, race there, issues in, there's in certainly, Louisville. There certainly is racism and there are race issues. And I think you have to be careful about the way you use your words and how we help each other to heal and how we move forward as a community. Because the reality is uh, most of us want police and we want officers to be safe. We don't want shootings in our community. And I have heard from a lot of folks, well, you walk and you march when a police officer kills somebody, but what about when one of you all kills? You know, listen, we hate violence, period. Mm -hmm. I am just anti-violence. I don't care who does it. And the reality is that we're all working, many of us are working very hard to reduce violence in our communities regardless. There's some things, you know, you hear this black on black crime. And I just uh, released something from the Urban League recently. You know, I think about 89% of white people who are murdered are murdered by other, other whites. Mm -hmm and blacks, about 82% <coughs> of blacks are murdered by other blacks. So there's no black on black crime. That's just something that was created. It's just crime. People kill who they're around, they kill who they know. But I think there's some responsibility to, again, when you are wrong, when you use words that incite, to walk away from that and to apologize when you know better and when you can do better and when you can push people forward. And I think there are opportunities to do that and we have to think about taking those opportunities. So. Mm -hmm. It, it is, it is I, of course, everybody knows I work for the mayor's office. I'm super supportive of the administration. And I think that, that folks work really hard to get it right. But you, it, it is hard to sit here and listen to you say we don't have a culture issue when the reality is part of that was reflected in the letter that you wrote last year. Well, Dave, uh, she's obviously uh, talking specifically about your letter. Uh, we can revisit what that letter was if you'd like, um, but I'd, I'd like to give you a chance to respond. Well, I mean, I, I think I responded uh, appropriately. I, I've made it clear many times what, what the letter was for, what it was about. It can't be, it's nothing that can be open for interpretation. I mean, I wrote the words down. You can read them. Uh, and, and if, you know, obviously everyone's not going to like everything that somebody else says. Um, but the fact of the matter is if you read the letter and actually read the words that I put down on paper, it's clear what I meant with that letter uh, about thanking the public. Uh, and, and I think it's important. I think, you know, police officers have rights too. We all would agree with that, I would think. And they have a right also to, to, to speak their mind and to say, look, we understand there's going to be, there's 800,000 law enforcement officers in this country and some of them are bad. Let's just be clear, right? But if people are going to say things that are not true, or, uh, or make a complaint that is false or something like that, we feel like we have a right to say, hey, that, hold on a minute, that's wrong too. Um, and and, and I, I put those things down. I mean, I wrote them down, but you know, people take that and you can make it whatever you want it to be, obviously. We've got a few more minutes left, and, and the thing I like about this conversation is that I'm getting a lot out of it, but how do people at home carry on these conversations in their daily lives? Because they're looking at a panel full of law degrees PhDs. Uh, you guys have exceptional educational credentials. This conversation is difficult for you all. How do people at home have it? So we do at the Urban League try to have these conversations with um, the vast majority of the community. You know, we have some um, open nights and we just, everybody talks. We come through and, and really talk about your feelings because sometimes you know, I always say it's not like post-traumatic stress disorder. Sometimes it's really ongoing traumatic stress disorder because it's where you're living. It's what you're going through every day and you need to get it out. And, um, you know, I always think about the Trayvon Martin case. And I just, because there, that wasn't law enforcement. But the way Mr. Zimmerman was handled, the way that this country divided, the way really even some law enforcement divided, like there was just an assumption that this young boy had done something wrong, that he had stolen the Skittles and the soda, that he had somehow violated the law and deserved what happened. That is just the place that many, many started from. And so when I hear police officers say, we want the benefit of the doubt, mm -hmm. that is what black people want. Yeah. We want the benefit of the doubt. Most of us are not criminals. Most police officers are not bad. They are doing a job. We are trying to all do the same thing. And so how do we start from a better place? I think that's how people 
um, first of all, in their homes really need to think about it and talk about those real cases. What happened with the Trayvon Martin case? When do we have an admission that, why does it take almost a year to get to a grand jury for some cases? And then others, if you did something right now, you'd be at a grand jury in no time. In an hour, you got six to 12 people that could be indicted. But what are, what are those special cases that take so long? Or you know, when you have a grand jury, like it was in Ferguson, six hours and you have no indictment, which chief and the sergeant will tell you, our grand jury, everyone gets indicted in five, five minutes. Yeah. You know, as the old law school adage go, you can indict a ham sandwich. And so those are things that are hard to explain because, you know, I talk to people every day who don't have law degrees. You know, the, my clients don't have law degrees, a lot of their families, I mean, they don't. And, and those things are hard to explain because I have to tell them, hell, this is what you're being offered. Well, how come this person over here, you know, they don't indict him, they don't indict this officer. And, and, and I bet, the, you know, the chief will tell you a lot of the problems, you want good public relations because it's hard, a lot of these, the homicides and things you're having trouble solving is because you have trouble getting people who want to cooperate. Well, and that's so, gonna change. Uh, uh, all this, all this, you know, we have PhDs, JDs, whatever, we didn't start there. You know, right. she started yeah. in, in, in the ghettos of the Bronx. Mm -hmm. I started in the projects of Atlanta. But the bottom line is this, people are tired of the mysticism, mm -hmm. the legal mysticism, the religious mysticism, you know, the, 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 the political mysticism, all of this stuff. This stuff is happening too frequently now, okay? It's too frequently. And, and people are seeing it, and they're going to demand answers. People are involved. Technology, it's, it's just not letting people hide it. Well, i got to tell you, this has been one of the most illuminating conversations uh, that, that I've heard on, on television in, in a long time. So I thank you all for being here, and I thank you all for joining us. We are hoping to continue the conversation. Uh, we hope that you continue it in your own homes and also your neighborhoods. We all have a stake, obviously, in improving the racial health of this community, and we can all play a role in moving our city forward. So for everyone here at WLKY, I'm Eric King. Good night.